Hi, good afternoon. A couple of things. One, uh, people are telling me that we're not getting, um, not getting signal and, and the like. So uh, we're going to try channel 74. And I just had an, an IT or computer technician here. So it's set up for 74. So switch it to 74. Also, if you get the three dots and a check mark, that means it's recorded. Most of you get the letter, you know, if you press B, you get B. But if you get the three dots and a check mark, it's being recorded. Now, I have to tell you that uh, by using the uh, podium, they move the receiver up here just in case. So now it's closer. So in case you are not getting range, you should get range. It shouldn't be a problem. So hopefully everything's recorded correctly. Push the letter, should be okay. You should see a you should see a letter. A check mark or a letter. Okay. Alright. Now, another uh, thing I wanted to start with, as I mentioned, I sent an email out and I said what I wanted to do, and this is based on office hours. So when people come to see me, they ask me lots of questions. And based on those questions, I said, well, let me review this one more time. So we're going to review the three methods. We're not going to review the specific identification. We'll review the average cost, FIFO, and the LIFO method on a perpetual basis. So we're not going to do the periodic. So in this illustration, if you look up on the screen, and if you didn't print this out, this is on Blackboard. It's in the course documents. It's within the course modules, the class notes. So I have a company that is Starting the year with 100 units at a dollar, it buys another 100 at two, and then on June 30th, it sells 160 units. Now, I don't know what method I'm using yet. I know it's perpetual. In the homework problems on exam problems, I could tell you they sold 100, uh, they sold those 160 units at $50. So I could have said they sold them at 30 or $1,000. That does not matter when you're trying to value ending inventory and cost of goods sold. You would need the selling price of that inventory for sales numbers and gross profit numbers. So right now, we don't need to know what they sold those at. I'm just worried about the ending inventory and the cost of goods sold. Then they purchased another 100 units at $3 at the end of the period, September 30th, and their ending inventory is 140 units. When you add up all the units that they have, minus what they sold, gives you ending inventory. If you add up all the units, beginning plus purchases, gives you goods available for sale, minus the ending inventory, minus the, excuse me, units sold, becomes the ending inventory. Now, applying the specific method, someone asked me if I would test you on specific identification. I might, in an essay, in a um, theory question, but in a problem, I'd have to tell you. I'd have to give you the answer. I'd have to say you sold you know, three units at a dollar and five units at three dollars. So you don't have to think about that from a testing perspective. But what you do have to think about is the FIFO basis. So let's do that first. Then we'll do last and first out an average cost. Under the FIFO basis, the first ones in are the first ones to be sold. Those would be your oldest cost. So what I'm trying to do is build logic. We talked about this during office hours today. It's very logical. It just takes some practice and some thinking. Just repeat this to yourself that if you're looking at FIFO, the first goods in are the first ones I sell, and they have to be the oldest cost. So therefore, if I sold 160 units at June 30th, they're going to be coming from the following. I'm going to sell the oldest first. The first ones in are 100 at 1, and I sell another 60 at two. So the 160 are coming out in this order. First one's in, 100 at a dollar. The next oldest cost is 60 at two. So when you look at the FIFO cost of goods sold here, it's going to be 160 units sold at $220. So 100 is your oldest at a dollar. The next oldest would be May 1st, 60 at two. So your, your cost of goods sold is 220 and the easiest way to get ending inventory is to take the cost of goods available for sale, which is up here at 600, minus the cost of goods sold gives you ending inventory. 
Now, I'll say one other thing and then I'll take some questions. If you don't want to get any inventory by simply subtracting the cost of goods sold from the goods available, you can then understand that ending inventory has to be the most recent under FIFO. So alternatively, you would have had 100 left at 3, and out of the May 1st purchase, you got 40 left at 2. So that's going to be your 380 of ending inventory. So any questions on first in, first out? Just want to be sure, based on questions that I had during office hours. Yeah. Well, we'll do that. Yeah, okay. So last and first out would be an opposite assumption with respect to the way you sell the goods. Right. If it's last in, first out, you, you change your assumption with respect to the way the goods flow out of the business. Now, you have to remember, in a very small business, I can obviously know, I know the units I'm selling, but we're, we're, these, the, the numbers up here are, are misleading. Think about a business that is selling hundreds of thousands of items every single day. You may just be grabbing things off a shelf and putting them on a truck or from a warehouse. You may not know exactly where they're coming from, so you make an assumption. The most logical assumption for businesses that sell items that are subject to style change, that are, could spoil or are perishable, or that are subject to technological change, is a FIFO assumption. That's your most logical assumption. And that's what we're doing here. So are there any questions, other questions, on first in, first out? Now, again, everyone worries about tests, multiple choice. I could give you, I'd probably give you something like this, and then give you a series of questions that follow. Cost of goods sold under FIFO is, ending inventory under LIFO is, and that would be based off the same database. Okay. Questions on FIFO? Anyone else? Uh, let's do the next one. I'm repeating, just so you're able to study, when you print this out, I'm repeating the base data. Now, uh, Jessica, I'll get to your comment. What if I make a LIFO assumption? Why would I make a LIFO assumption? When is a LIFO assumption reasonable? Now, of course, LIFO is very popular for tax, so it does become a tax method that is used very often. However, the logic here is that you have a business where you might have items in bins, and if they're not perishable, someone comes in, wants to buy something like you know, uh, nuts and bolts, or a hammer, or a screwdriver, and it doesn't really become obsolete, just take it from the front and sell it. That could have been the last item you got on a, on a shipment. It could be the newest item. So the LIFO assumption could make sense in that scenario. So in this case, same company, I'm selling 160 units, but now I'm selling the last ones in. The cost of goods sold under LIFO is the newest or the most recent. So when I sell 160, where are they going to come from? The most recent purchase, the newest items, 100 at 2. Then I have 60 more, and they have to come out of the next most recent, which is 60 at 1. So if you look at the summary for cost of goods sold, my cost of goods sold is going to be 260. 260. And the inventory, of course, is just the difference between the cost of goods available for sale minus the cost of goods sold. Or, if you wanted to do the cost of goods sold, it would be what remains out of the oldest cost. Remember, someone just asked me about that joke, you know, fish. First in, still here. Life always fish. First ones in are still here. The old ones are kind of still around. Out of those old units, you've got The 40, I just want to cover that if I can, there you go. So out of those old units, if you sold 60 out of the base or the beginning inventory, you got 40 left at a dollar, and you didn't sell any of the new purchases, correct? So on a perpetual basis, nothing is sold here. The sale happened before that purchase. So you have 40 at a dollar, and you have 100 at three. So the ending inventory would be 340, as you can see. So the answer, and, and by the way, what I find students, the biggest mistakes are they switch the cost of goods sold with ending inventory. 
So if I ask you for the first in, first out ending inventory, a lot of students give me the cost of goods sold. So just read the questions carefully and make sure you have it right. So in this case, the cost of goods sold is going to be the 260 and the 340 is the ending inventory. Now there's a logic check or a sanity check if you like. Ending inventory plus the cost of goods sold always has to equal the cost of goods available. Remember that scale I drew out? You know, you got beginning inventory plus purchases, that equals 600. What comes out of that box has to be 600. So your ending inventory and your cost of goods sold must equal, it must equal 600. So the 260 plus the 340. Now, any questions about that assumption. Again, we talked about mining. When you mine coal or gypsum rock, you throw it up into a pile, you sell it off the top. Makes sense. You sell your newest units first. Okay. And you can use this. I think this is a good example to use to study. It's not that complicated. And it will make sure that you're very clear regarding the concepts. Yeah? Uh, because I have a typo in there. So that's Thank you. So that's the LIFO. Okay, so that's LIFO. Yes, LIFO winning inventory. Just correct that, thank you. And I'll correct that on, uh, on Blackboard also. Yeah, it's LIFO winning inventory. Yes? Yeah, um, if I tell the alternate computation, if I tell you that cost of goods sold under LIFO is the uh, is the most recent cost, then ending inventory has to be the oldest, right, logically. So out of that base layer, or out of that beginning inventory, if you sold $60 or 60 units from here, there has to be 40 left. Now you also sold all of the May 1st purchase, there's nothing left there. So the only thing that's left is 100 units at three. See, so just try to follow the logic. And I think by using this, and I did, and I, I always try to use the examples you find in your textbook, but I think in this case, using something more like straightforward like this, I think it's a little bit easier to follow. And either one. I mean, again, I will correct this. So this is um, LIFO in the inventory. Any other questions on LIFO? All right, the last one is going to be the average cost. And we have the same data for average cost. Now, what would you use average cost, or when would you use the average cost? If you're selling a very high volume of similar or homogeneous products, so as I always mention, fuel oil or indistinguishable units. You can't tell when you bought the fuel, whether you bought it yesterday or three weeks ago, it's kind of mixed together. So you use an averaging process. So in this case, I can just take the same table and let me show you how I built this one. I said, look, you start the year with 100 units, it costs you a dollar, the average cost is total cost available divided by number of units. That's the average cost. The average cost is always the cost available divided by 100 units. Now, the average is going to move. It's a moving average. How does it move? Every time you buy inventory, the average changes. And that new average is used to value the cost of goods sold. So it's only when you buy units does that average change. So the next item up is a May 1st purchase. It's 100 units at two. That's $200, and at this point, you've got 200 units, and your total cost available is 300. So your average cost now becomes what? 150. So if you just stop right there, your average cost is 150. And every time you buy inventory, the cost or the average is going to change. And the average is always the ratio of the total cost divided by the units that are available at that point. Let me just stop here. Does anyone have any questions with respect to the average? The average is taken any time you buy units. Yeah, Jeffrey. Yeah, that's right. Total cost divided by total units. 
Yeah. Now that cost of 150, that average cost, is used for your cost of goods sold. Okay. So now anytime you sell a unit after that point, you're going to sell them at $1.50. So if I sold 160 units at $1.50, my cost of goods sold is 240. And now at this point, if I take the average cost, I had 200 units, I sold 160, I got 40 left. I had 300 in total cost, I sell $240 worth of inventory, I got $60 left, what's my average? It's still 160. So the average does not change after something is sold. The average does not change after something is sold. It's only changed with purchases. So in this case, after the 160, I have 40 left, and I've got $60 of cost remaining. The average is still 150. And then finally, when I bought the other 100 units at three, I now have 140 units available, and my total cost of ending inventory is 360. My new average cost is 360, the cost available, divided by the units available, gives me 257. So now my new average cost is 257. So the question is, if I sell units immediately, I sell one unit immediately, my cost of goods sold is $2.57. So the next sale is going to be valued or costed at 257. The next cost of goods sold, if I don't buy anything else, it doesn't change the average. The average stays at 257, and that will become the cost of goods sold on the next sale. And in summary, of course, it has to add to 600. So my cost of goods sold was 240, and my ending inventory is 360. So the average cost is a moving average. Every time you have a new purchase, the average changes. Any time you have a sale, you use that average to cost the sale, to get the cost of goods sold. And it is Really, it is a weighted average because you notice that the average is weighted by sort of the number of units in the batch, if you like, because you would obviously think, if you look at the, the new average of 257, you only have 40 units at $1.50, but you have 100 units at three. So more weight, these are the weights, the units are the weights on those prices. So there's more weight being placed on the $3 than on the 150. So therefore, you would expect the average to be higher than 150. It's going to be 257. All right, so those are the three methods. That's what you need to focus on. And more importantly, of course, we need to understand what it does to our financial statements. But the bottom line here is you've got to be able to make these calculations. So I would use this as a guide, of course, doing the homework and other you know, other resources available to you. But I just wanted to spend the first 20 minutes of class addressing this question and to see if you have any other questions. So anyone have any other questions on this? And I would ask you to go over this. If you still have questions, let me know, and I'll make sure that we clear, we clear them up for you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, no. The question is, would you have to reset the average in the next fiscal year? No. That 257 carries into the next year. As soon as you buy something else, the average is recalculated. It's only on a purchase. It's not time sensitive. Any other questions? Yeah, Brent. Um, yeah, I mean, the average cost of logic is when you can't differentiate, you can't see the units, and they don't have a, um, um, an SKU or a, a barcode, you can't see them. But the other cases we use them is when inventory is not material, it's insignificant, and you, know, you might be using like supplies, so office supplies, pens, paper, so you may take an average of that inventory because you can't really um, keep track, it's, it's, it's not practical to keep track of that inventory. So you would use an average. Yes? Uh, we're gonna, we'll let you know. Yeah, probably. Okay. All right. 
Any other questions? Okay. All right, now, the other issue is the summary. And of course, I have a narrative here, which, you, which I'm going to go over right now. We did this, this is the last thing we did on Tuesday for the illustration that we covered from the textbook. Let's go over it again, and everything below this explains the, the theory. In a period of rising prices, in a period of rising prices, and as long as inventory is not shrinking, as long as it's constant or at the same level, when you look at the results, first in, first out, in a period of inflation, gives you an ending inventory that is as close as possible to current value. So the FIFO ending inventory is going to give you a balance sheet value that's very close to what the inventory is worth. Why? Because if the, the old ones, the first ones in, are sold first, the newest units are still in inventory, or the cost. So it gives you a balance sheet value that is very close to the current value, the current cost of these items. This is important because if you're going to lend money to the company and using the inventory as collateral, so let's say you go to the bank, you have a business, and you say you want to borrow $10,000, and they say, well, look, if you can't pay the loan, what could I get from you? I'm going to be able to get your, your inventory. So I can go in and seize the inventory. If I take that inventory, what, it's, what is it worth? Well, at least the FIFO basis gives you a better valuation of what it may be worth. The problem is that the cost of goods sold is the lowest, and it gives you the highest profit. And a lot of people believe that is called paper or phantom profits. You'll read that in the textbook. I mentioned that on Tuesday, that these profits are somewhat artificial. It's because of the way you valued inventory. Nonetheless, it gives you the highest profit. When you look at the average cost, it falls in between the two. The average cost falls in between the two, and the LIFO is going to give you, from an income statement perspective, the highest cost of goods sold. That's why, in a period of inflation, it's the most popular for tax purposes. It gives you the highest tax deduction. It will give you the lowest net income. So LIFO will give you the lowest net income. It gives you the highest tax deductions, and that's what makes it popular for tax purposes. Of course, on the balance sheet side, notice it gives you the lowest inventory value. So what you're learning or what you're really witnessing right now in this discussion is what happens when managers and financial analysts look at a balance sheet. They need to know the method. Remember I keep saying it's like measuring distance. You need to know how the distance was measured. Remember, those are the same units. I hope you appreciate the fact that it's the same units that are left over. It's the same 160 units that you've sold. And it's the same 140 units that you have in ending inventory. Same units valued differently. And the different valuation gives a different perception. So that when I read the financial statements and I find out that your company is using LIFO, I know that inventory is going to be a little bit understated, a little lower, and I know the cost of goods sold is higher. And I know the profit's going to be a little bit lower. So you don't necessarily, I mean, beyond this course, if you're not an accounting major, beyond this course, you may not ever do a calculation like this again. But what you do need to remember is the direction, the bias, the impact of these methods on someone's judgment. And that's what we're doing on this table. Yeah. How, do you, how are you going to know based on the interest Yep. Yeah, how do you know? Footnotes. The footnotes would have to tell you that this company values inventory. In fact, uh, there was a footnote from, what was it, Green Mountain Coffee or something? And it said, the company uses the FIFO basis, lower of cost or market FIFO. So you would, you would, you would be able to find out. Now, of course, we're going to look at some financial ratios in a minute um, you know, regarding LIFO. And I'll get back to this, but you can use this as a summary. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if things happen where price, let's say prices start to drop, you know, or if, or if prices are variable, 
You know, that's why sometimes when you have precious metals, you've got variable prices like gold and other precious metals, you'd have variable um, prices. You tend to use specific identification in that case, right? Because prices are all over the place. Now, remember, now this, what's good about your question is just, again, reminding me that rising prices are needed for this table to be valid. If prices are going in the other direction, what happens? The table flips. The table is going to flip. So it's going to be the opposite. And we've got notes in your PowerPoint and in the textbook. We have, we have tables that show you just the opposite when prices are falling. Now, what industries, I think I, I asked this back when we first started, what industries tend to have prices that fall? What was like, you know, what could have been $3,000 two years ago and now you can get it for 600 bucks? Electronics, right? Televisions, computers. So in industries like technology or electronics, you find that those companies would rather use what? FIFO for tax purposes because it gives them a higher tax deduction. It's just the opposite of what you see here. So if you look at the cost of goods sold column, 260 is the LIFO number for rising prices. For falling prices, it could be just the opposite, where FIFO gives you the better or the higher cost of goods sold. All right, so I don't know if there are any other questions. I just thought I'd, I'd rather spend 20 to 30 minutes on that now rather than have you still um, you know, confused. And if you're still confused, go over this again, ask some questions, and make sure that you have a good understanding of not only the calculations, but also some of the um, some of the theory. Okay, now I'm going to ask you some questions right now. Make sure you're on 74. If you just got here, we're going to try this. Um, you know, people, we're starting to get. I'm starting to get fewer and fewer emails about not getting clicker scores, which is a good thing. But let's just be sure. So, go on 74, and I'll ask a couple of questions. So let's go to this first one. This is uh, learning objective three. This should be slide 67. All right, and I want to know, in a period of rising prices, FIFO results in a higher cost of goods sold and a lower gross profit than LIFO. Okay. And we've got things working now, so clock is on. I just did this like literally three seconds ago, so you don't get this wrong. Sponsors are coming in really quick, so I think it's easy. All right. Okay, good. So all right, so we got 18% still, 18% still getting this thing wrong. It's um, FIFO would not give you the highest cost of goods sold in rising prices. It would give you the lower because it's the first ones in at the old low cost. It gives you the higher ending inventory. Now, this is a perfect example of what I was saying before. If you don't read the question, you answer it the wrong way. You give me cost of goods sold when I want ending inventory. You give me ending inventory when I want cost of goods sold. So just make sure you read those correctly. Okay, let's do one more, and then we'll move ahead. Okay, so I'm going to do... All right, so this one, I've got... I want to know which method in a declining price environment will give you the highest tax deduction and the lowest income. Okay. I'd read that declining prices.
All right. Oh. Come on, man. All right. Uh, let's read the question. All right. Now, this, this, uh, this is a, a perfect example of why I like to use these clicker questions because now, if you look at this, prices are, I just said it, we talked about like TVs and computers, I thought I had your interest, electronics. If prices are declining and you use the FIFO basis, the first ones in are the first ones sold. That's your cost of goods sold. The older ones are at higher prices, it gives you a higher tax deduction and it minimizes your tax benefit, okay? So again, when you read these questions, and you know, I'm going over, when I go over exams in my office with people, they're all like, oh, come on, I can't believe I did that. That's exactly what happened here. Make sure you read them carefully. If you just see, you know, lower taxes, you think LIFO right away. Make sure you understand the direction of prices. Okay, so that's it for now on the questions. And now we're going to move ahead to this lower of cost or market rule. And the lower of cost or market rule is going to be an application. Lower of cost or market rule is an application of conservatism. At the end of the year, at the end of the period, we're going to wind up with inventory value at either LIFO, FIFO, average cost, whatever that may be. We have to do a test for obsolescence. This is a test for obsolescence, and we call it the lower of cost or market. You cannot carry inventory above what it's worth in terms of its replacement. So when we look at the lower of cost of market, we're trying to determine whether or not the value or the cost of inventory is still going to be a valid measure of what we could expect in terms of its replacement value or its replacement cost. So that the market value is really its replacement cost. And if we find out that the replacement cost falls below, or at least the market value falls below the cost, it means that we have to take an adjustment and it may indicate that inventory is potentially obsolete. So let me give you an example. It tells you we have this Aiden Inc. is holding inventory that costs $2 million. And I'm going to put something on the projector in a moment. So you have inventory that costs $2 million. You find out that the market value of the inventory is 1.2. That means that the inventory is overstated by 0.8. And this has to be written down. You cannot carry inventory above its expected usefulness. In other words, an asset is defined as an economic benefit to the company, and you cannot overstate it. Now, to show you what we were sort of doing, this is one of the homework questions we were doing during office hours today. So we're saying that when you look at merchandise inventory, For this company, sorry, the merchandise inventory was two million. Now we tell you that the market value is 1.2. This is its it's known as replacement cost. In this case, the inventory is overstated, and you have to make an adjustment. You have to write this inventory down to market. So the idea is you carry it, and we have to remember also, and let me be sure, this is at its cost. Right now, inventory is at cost. That cost could be what? Average, it could be LIFO or it could be FIFO cost. It could be any of the cost measures that we use. So what I would need to do is I need to reduce the inventory by 0.8. You know, I'm going to do that. I have to make an adjustment. 
we flow this through the cost of goods sold. So we're increasing the cost of goods sold as an expense by 0.8, and we credit the merchandise inventory for 0.8. And that is to write the inventory down to market, and that's an adjustment. Let me make sure I'm on the screen. That's an adjustment that we make. And after we make that adjustment, and the inventory is now on the balance sheet at 1.2 million. And this is now at the lower of cost or market, at LCM, lower of, lower of cost or market. And this is based on conservatism in that when faced with two alternative valuation methods, you use the one that is least likely to overstate assets. So you'd write this down, and that is a loss that flows through the cost of goods sold. And again, it's based on conservatism. So once again, going back to exam one, based on my reviews with students, bigger problem, I think, than the mechanics, than the numbers, is the application of some of these principles. So this is an application, law of cost to market, is an application of conservatism. It's an application of conservatism. Now, any questions here? And this, there's also a journal entry in the, um, in the PowerPoints that we, we don't necessarily have to do. It's the same, same thing. Um, any questions? So you have to value that lower of cost or market. Now, I have, yes? Yeah, you debit the cost of goods sold and reduce the inventory. The inventory's got to be reduced by a credit. Always, yeah. I mean, it, now, if you make an entry, do you always have to make an entry? We were, we were doing some examples today where maybe, maybe in one of the homework problems, you may not have to make an entry. So for example, let me just change this. Merchandise inventory at cost, and again, it's two million, and what if the market value the replacement cost of that inventory is 2.5. Do I need an adjustment? No. It's already at, it's carried at 2 million. Market value is 2.5. No adjustment is needed because you're already at the lower on your balance sheet. So you make no adjustment here. And you'll see that in some of the assignments. So that's another possibility. So you're already at the lower of the two. Yes? No. Mm -mm. No. We use remedy principles now. So you've got to go back to the concepts. The concept of historical cost. Assets generally stay at cost, except in cases of conservatism. So conservatism allows you to write it down, but conservatism will not allow you to write it up. The only time we, we use fair values or market values are for certain investment securities, which we'll see in a few weeks. So we generally don't use fair value in our balance sheet or market value. Okay, any other questions on this? We're going to be hitting a couple of short topics now before we conclude this chapter. And there's some questions that are pretty easy on the back of this, which I pretty much answered, so we don't have to worry. Okay, anything else? All right, next, let's go back. And there's another example here, which I said is the same. You don't have to worry about it. Um, in this case, I'll just answer these for you. You have to adjust when the replacement cost is less. Well, that's true. So if you're on, OK, so it has to be written down. And the next one, the cost of goods sold is credited. Well, no, it's got to be debited. Right, you always debit the cost of goods sold for the loss. So that one is false. 
And the next one, is this conservatism? Yes. And that makes it true. That makes it true. All right. The next problem we're going to have is what if you make a mistake or you have inventory errors? So our next learning objective or the next goal for today would be to take a look at what happens if you have inventory errors. Inventory errors are going to be a little bit difficult but pretty interesting because inventory errors always reverse themselves out. And the reason for that is if you remember, balance sheet accounts are what? Permanent accounts. And they carry over period after period. So if there's an error in ending inventory in the first year, it becomes the error where? In beginning inventory in the next year. So these errors will always reverse themselves out after one year. Now the importance of inventory errors is not only because it will affect ending inventory, it's important because it also affects the cost of goods sold. So the problem with inventory errors is that not only does it affect the balance sheet, it affects the cost of goods sold and it affects the gross profit. So that when you look at the, and it does reverse out, when you look at this T account, I'm going to show you another example in a minute, but when you look at this T account, and this is something you have to understand, that if you overstate ending inventory, you're going to understate cost of goods sold. Now, why is that? Remember that scale I drew out? I just don't like drawing out boxes. I did it for a reason. You got a fixed amount of goods available. If you put too much in one box, there's not enough in the other, right? So if you put too much in ending inventory, you're going to understate cost of goods sold and overstate profit. So it's also very simple. And I, and I think I mentioned that we don't really, um, we're not going to go back to the accounting equation too much, but if you think about the accounting equation, in this case, if I overstate inventory by 5,000, I'm going to overstate income. That's going to be in retained earnings because net income is going to be too high. So no change on liabilities. So the higher the ending inventory, the higher the net income. There's a direct relationship between overstating inventory and overstating income. Now, there's a really, really interesting fraud case if you're ever interested, there was a, uh, a person, there was a, well, there's a pharmacy, there was a pharmacy chain known as Farmore, and the person that owned this, his name was Mickey Monus, M-O-N-U-S, if you look this up, he believed that basketball shouldn't be played by people that could stand up and just throw them in the basket. So he created what was known as a midget basketball league. I couldn't play. Yeah, I think six feet, you, could, you, couldn't be, um, you couldn't be more than six feet tall. He put so much money into this that his business, Far More Pharmacy, was losing lots of money. How did he cover up the cash? He overstated inventory. Cases of Coca-Cola in the pharmacy were sitting there for like 80 bucks, $100 of soda. He was overstating his inventory. And unfortunately, the public accounting firm was also complicit. They were also you know, going along with this as well. A lot of people got arrested from this fraud as well. But the way he covered up his use of cash. He took the cash out of the business and put it into this basketball league. It was called the World Basketball League. So it's, it's an interesting fraud case. There was a front line. You guys don't watch front line. You're too young for that. But there's a front line which talks about this. It's pretty sad. You see all these people get arrested, young people, sort of not, not much older than you. Uh, but it happens. So the, a lot of people, or a lot of fraud, I should say, is done by overstating inventory. You cover up cash taken out. You have less cash, you've got to balance the balance sheet, you overstate the inventory. So this is a common fraud, you know, hopefully not too common, but again, there's a direct relationship between the ending inventory and profit. Okay, and that's what we're telling you here. Okay, now, you could also understate inventory, and if you understate inventory, we go to the next one, if you understate inventory, it's just the opposite. 
if you, have, if you don't have enough in ending inventory, then cost of goods sold is higher and your profit is lower. Now again, remember, there's a direct relationship between ending inventory and income. The higher the inventory, the higher the income. The lower the inventory, the lower the income. So going back to the accounting equation, if you take the same numbers now, and if you understate by 1.2, no change in liabilities, net income will be lower by the 1.2. Okay, so there's a direct relationship between the ending inventory and net income. Higher the ending inventory, the higher the net income, lower the ending inventory, the lower the net income. Let me show you some numbers in a second. Now, how do these reverse out? Well, the ending inventory of one year becomes what? The beginning inventory of the next year? So it just reverses itself out and beginning inventory has an opposite effect, an equal and opposite effect. So if you go to the slide 85, you'll find out that the ending inventory and beginning inventory have equal and opposite effects. So if you have an, an understated beginning inventory, you overstate net income. And if you overstate the beginning inventory, you have an understated income. So the easiest way to remember this is that ending inventory is directly related to profit. Beginning inventory is inversely related to profit. Now again, that's something you have to internalize, and probably the best way to do this is to take a, an example. Now I'm going to show you that in just a second. So let me see. I wonder if the, um, you know what, I'll put this on the doc cam. I think it might be easier to follow. Okay. All right, so if you take a look at 87, this is on slide 87. And this is the correct information. Correct information says that you start the year with 100 units, or $100 rather, you buy $300 worth of inventory, goods available for sale of 400. Ending inventory is 250, and your cost of goods sold is 150. That's the correct number. Now, the most important part of this right now for you is to see that the ending inventory of one year becomes the beginning inventory of the next. Because this is a balance sheet account, it's a permanent or a real account. It carries over period after period. So the beginning inventory in year two was the ending inventory of year one. Now you purchase another three, 550 available, minus ending inventory gives you a cost of goods sold of 100. So the correct numbers would be 150 of COGS and 100 of COGS in year two. Now, let's see where the error could come into play. The problem here is that instead of having an ending inventory of, it should have been 250, instead of having an ending inventory of 250, you overstate it by 30. So that beginning inventory is the same, purchases are the same, goods available are the same. When you subtract out the ending inventory of 280, you get a cost of goods sold of 120 versus the cost of goods sold of 150. So cost of goods sold is lower by 30, but profit and net income are higher by 30. So the lower the cost of goods sold, the higher the profit. So the higher the ending inventory, profit is overstated. Now, this is not a problem as long as you, and the fraud, the World Basketball League fraud that I described, of course, just kept going. They just kept adding on the ending inventory. But in the event that you don't do anything and you make a mistake and you don't catch the error, then what happens is that the mistake in ending inventory is carried in the beginning. So you notice what happens here, that the cost of goods sold now, instead of being 100, which is the correct number, now goes to 130. So you had overstated profit by 30 in the first year, you understated it by 30 in the second year. Therefore, it reverses itself out 
after that one year period. So what you have to do is just make sure that you understand, I think the easiest way to see this is that ending inventory is going to be directly related to the profit. The higher the ending inventory, the higher profit. Beginning inventory is inversely related so that the higher the ending inventory or the beginning inventory, the lower the profit. Now, something you have to work on, and this is a good example. You might have some other examples in the text. So again, another short or quick topic. Let's take some questions before I ask you a few. Right here, 280? Yes. Yeah. It should have been 250. Yeah, the, the inventory, the beginning inventory is correct in year one. The purchases are correct in year one. And the goods available are correct. Or I could give you the ending inventory. Yeah. I could, I would, in this case, I'm giving you the ending inventory. Okay. And I want to know the effect on profit. Okay. Right? So I would tell you the ending inventory is overstated by 30. And you should know that gross profit and income is overstated by 30. Okay, so di that direct relationship is, is there. OK. So again, let's go back. And so here's the same example on the PowerPoint. So you have this illustration as well. All right. So let's take a look. We'll do some. And by the way, there's a summary. There's another summary on, on slide 88 um, as well. Okay. All right. Well, let's take some questions. Overstating ending inventory in the current period results in an understatement of net income in the current period. So a minute to win it. Got to get this one right. One hundred percent on this one. Ah. Ah. All right. Oh, look. Question again. You got it wrong. Make sure you understand that if you overstate ending inventory, you overstate net income. So I know I said it a couple of times, but again, so all right. Try another one. All right, here. Now you're talking about talking about exam questions, right? Uh, Jeffrey's mentioned an exam. Let's go to the next one. All right. So let's try this one, and let's see. So here's a multiple choice question. Here's where you got to read it carefully. Okay, so you overstated inventory by 3.5. They're okay, coming down, let's see what we got. All right. That's all right, man. Go on. Okay. Nice. Okay. Okay. 
I'm glad to see that, but if you got it wrong, let's go through the let's go through the people that did A. Net income for the current period would be understated. Of course not. We just said that a thousand times. So um, B is the correct answer. Ending inventory for uh, the next period. So you see, if you did actually a lot of people did C. If you did C, you just didn't read it. Ending inventory for the next period will be overstated. No. Beginning inventory for the next period would be overstated. And the cost of goods sold uh, for the next accounting period would be understated. Well, no, it would, it would correct itself so that it would actually overstate the COGS in the next period. Yep. Yep. If you um, no, it, it's it's only if it's in the ending goes to beginning, not the other way around. All right, ending inventory affects beginning. Beginning doesn't affect ending. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. Now, here's a good here's a good application. What I want to do now is just show you if you remember the operating cycle. When we talked about that operating cycle, again, you got a business that puts cash, accounts payable, then you buy inventory, you got to sell it, you got receivables, you got to collect it. There are ratios, financial ratios, that could be used to help you measure how long it takes you to sell your inventory. And we're going to see in the next chapter, we go to chapter 8 next, how long it takes you to collect those receivables. So how long does it take you to sell inventory? How long does it take you on average to collect? This way you can measure the length of that operating cycle. And to do that, we use a measure called inventory turnover. Inventory turnover is the ratio of cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. Average inventory is simply beginning plus ending divided by two. We also, and I'm going to give you a very simple example in a minute, this tells you how quickly inventory is being sold. If, tur if turnover is not fast enough, it means that inventory could be obsolete. In addition, when I'm going to show you the, I'll put this up on the um, overhead in a second. In addition, we can convert this in days. I can measure the operating cycle by taking 365 and dividing it by the inventory turnover. So the longer it takes me to sell the inventory, the more risk I have that I'm going to have obsolete inventory, and the longer the days or the, the, the longer the period it takes me to sell, the more likely it is that I'm going to need to borrow money to pay for my accounts payable. So let me give you a very simple example here. And let's say that you have a beginning inventory. I'll put this right here if I can find it. There it is. I got beginning inventory of 300. Ending inventory of 100, and I've got cost of goods sold of 4,000. Now, I want to calculate how many times per year the company goes from full stock to stock out. That's known as inventory turnover. Cost of goods sold over average inventory. Now the average inventory is beginning plus ending divided by two. So that's my average, average balance. And I'll explain why we do an average in a second. Right, so that means I turn over my inventory 20 times per year. Now, why do we use the average? Well, take a look at this ratio. And when you start looking at financial ratios, you're going to understand that all financial ratios that are built in the following way will use an average in the denominator. Cost of goods sold. What statement is that on? Cost of goods sold. What, fin what, in what income statement? Of course. Okay, you find it on the income statement. Balance sheet has inventory. The income statement is what kind of 
there, what has what types of variables? Flow variables or static variables? Flow. Balance sheet has static variables. So to try to capture a flow, you take the average balance for the year. So it makes it more like an apples to apples ratio as we call it. Because if you divide it by either the beginning or the ending balance, you could bias the ratio. So again, 20 times per year, I go from full stock to stock out. Now, I have a question. And it's a very, very legitimate question. In a period of rising prices, I'm, I'm a financial analyst, and I'm looking at the turnover. I'm a bank analyst, and I'm thinking about lending money. And I'm going to use your inventory as collateral. But I've got to make sure you're selling that inventory that it's not obsolete. So I do a test for obsolescence. I'm looking at your inventory records, and I find out you use LIFO. What does LIFO do to that ratio in a period of rising prices? What, what happens to cost of goods sold? Is it higher or lower than the other methods? Higher. And is inventory lower? It's lower. So LIFO biases the ratio upward. So once again, as I said, once you get done here, you know, after December 20th, you're not going to have to calculate this again unless you're an accounting major. But you do need to know that LIFO is going to, LIFO would tend to bias cost of goods sold higher, inventory would be lower, and this would be an upward bias relative to a FIFO company. So that with the information, and Amir asked the question, where do I find out where this company? Yeah, you just read the footnotes. It'll tell you. We use the LIFO basis. So the analyst or the, the loan officer understands that there is a built-in bias in that ratio. Now, this doesn't help me as much with respect to measuring the operating cycle. If I wanted to measure the operating cycle, they, what are they calling it? Day sales and inventory. I'd rather call this a holding interval or a holding period. This is going to be 365 divided by the turnover ratio. So this means that I turn my inventory over every 18 days. So I'm only holding inventory for 18 days. And that may be pretty good, because that means if I can collect quickly, I'll have enough money to pay off my accounts payable. And that's the, that's the and even look at marketing or retail side of this, you have to think about some of these measures. So I can measure how long I'm stuck with inventory. And I don't know if you know this, but if, you, um, if you're ever thinking about, or someone in your, your house is thinking about buying a car, you could, I think I mentioned this, you could find out the average number of days a certain model stays on the lot. Right? So if, if, if you're trying to compare you know, one car versus another, a Honda Accord versus a Camry, and they tell you the average inventory held for a Camry is, is 35 days, that's how much stock they have, and for a Honda, they only have like 20 days. Well, obviously, they're moving the Hondas faster, and you might get a better deal on the Camry if, you're, if they're stuck with them. So this, this is published information on Edmunds and a lot of the uh, auto websites. So this number can help you even in personal, biz, personal transactions, but it's very important from a business transaction or a business um, perspective as well. OK, so. We now can do this. Next chapter, I'm going to do one more thing in this chapter, but next chapter, we're going to find out how long it takes you to collect the receivables. So if I add up how long it takes me to collect receivables versus how long it takes me to sell the inventory, I can tell you on average how long you have to wait for cash. And that will help me understand if you could pay your bills. So if you, if you collect your receivables in 30 days, Let's say it takes you 30 days to collect your receivables. That's 48 days you've got to wait for cash. If I'm selling to you on a 30-day credit, you're not going to be able to pay your bills unless you do what? Borrow on a line of credit. So there's lots of information that is included in the financial statements. You just need to know how to use them through these ratios. Okay. 
Now, the last thing I'm going to do, we're not going to do anything on um, the periodic system okay, in class. You might see that on a homework basis. But what I want to do is I want to go to, yes, I want to go to the estimating inventory as your last topic for this chapter. And sometimes we have to estimate ending inventory. We have to estimate ending inventory for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, we had a lot of hurricane damage on the East Coast, and we understand that lots of businesses were damaged. How do they get insurance reimbursement? Insurance company comes in. If they can't value the inventory, a lot of the inventory gets washed away. Some of it wasn't even, you know, if it's in, in the ocean, they can't count it. If it's destroyed, we just had a, you know, a boardwalk fire. If the inventory is destroyed by fire, how do you, you know, value the loss? We can estimate ending inventory by a couple of different methods. We can use the gross profit approach, or we can use the retail approach. So the two methods, again, that we're going to use to estimate ending inventory is going to be gross profit and retail. And again, it's, it's not only if you can't count inventory, sometimes you don't have enough time to count inventory. A lot of cases, I worked for Sears when I was going to college, so we used to take inventories every Friday. And we used to do that and compare it to an estimation. And we were trying to uncover shortages, theft. You know, sometimes items would just get kicked under a bin or something. You'd lose items. Sometimes items were being pilfered. So in order to keep track, we would take a physical inventory every Friday, and we would compare it to an estimate. Sometimes you don't have the manpower or the uh, workers to take the physical inventory. So we would then might, you know, might rely on an estimated amount. So the estimated amounts could be used also when it may not be practical to come up with the actual count. Now, what we're going to do is, in a lot of ways, sort of flip the cost of goods sold formula that you might see in a perpetual basis, so that you have beginning inventory plus purchases, goods available, and that would give you the amount you have available for sale. And then you subtract the cost of goods sold, and you would get your ending inventory. But what we have to do and let me put this up on the screen for you. What we have to do in this case is the following. We have to assume that the beginning inventory is going to be recorded somewhere. It's going to be in your records. So that's going to be known. So you have computer records someplace, as long as those weren't destroyed, but you've got computer records in the corporate headquarters, not necessarily in the warehouse. You also know the amount of purchases, so goods available is known. We're then going to estimate the cost of goods sold. And we can do that in a couple of different ways. And that will give us an estimated ending inventory. <laughs> so you know your beginning inventory. You know your purchases. But we have to come up with an estimated ending inventory. Now, this is the foundation for the gross profit approach. So let's now take a look at that gross profit method. I'll give you a simple example, and then we'll show you the retail method. Retail method is built in a very similar way, where you'd have to come up with an estimated cost of goods sold. And the way you can come up with an estimated cost of goods sold If you know your sales, you could estimate gross profit. How do you estimate gross profit? You could base it on an historical gross profit percentage. You remember we calculated gross profit percentages. 
What if your company operates on a 40% profit margin for the last five years? So I would just, I'd be able to take 40% of sales, and that would be my gross profit. And if I subtract that, and I'll show you some numbers in a second, that could give me my estimated cost of goods sold. So this is going to be based on historical or past experience. That's been based on past experience. All right, so let's do the example that's in the, in the text. All right, so on slide 122, you've got this example. It tells you that the beginning inventory was 14,000. They purchased 66,000 for the year. They have sales of 100,000. The normal or the historical gross profit percentage for this company was 40%. That means that on average, every sales dollar for 40% or 40 cents on a dollar is profit, 60 cents on a dollar is cost. So if I know my percentage of profit, I can then estimate the cost of sales. So that I now know that my cost of goods sold would be 60. If 40,000 would be my estimated gross profit, then my estimated cost of goods sold would be 60. And when we start to build this, we would see that if you took your beginning inventory, which you know, your purchases of 66, which you know, gives you a cost of goods available of 80. Your estimated cost of goods sold is 60, and that comes from sales that you know and your estimated gross profit. By the way, the easier way to do this for me is if my gross profit percentage is 40%, what's my cost of goods sold percentage? 60. So why not just take 60 times sales and get the 60,000 directly? So you could, you could do that too. But again, this is why we call it the gross profit method. And our estimated ending inventory under the gross profit method is going to be 20,000. Now, that 20,000 could be compared to an actual count. That 20,000 could become an insurance estimate that I give to the insurance adjuster on a claim. And there is a very interesting area. I mean, accounting is not interesting, right? But there is an interesting area of accounting, which is uh, known as forensic accounting. FBI, you can carry a firearm. Uh, they do forensic accounting. Most of the fraud is white collar crime. And a lot of it is done by using estimation techniques based off of this, obviously much more sophisticated. But forensic accounting, you'd send out, a lot of the times, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people I know that do this go to a lot of exotic locations, but unfortunately it's generally after a hurricane. So, you know, it's not that nice, but you might go to the Bahamas and go to a company and try to examine their damage, and you can come up with their estimated ending inventory. Now, another way to do this is to use the retail method. Now, the retail method is very similar. And anyone that works in retail, yeah, I know. Anyone that works in retail should know that you keep your records. There's a dual record system. You keep one set of records at cost and one set of records at selling prices. One set of records at cost and one at selling prices. What you're going to wind up with is a situation where Instead of taking an historical gross profit percentage, you could actually get what is known as a cost to retail ratio. The cost to retail ratio is the ratio of goods available for sale at cost. So that's your historical cost divided by the goods available for sale at selling prices or retail. So that is a little bit better, and, and, I, and you should know that companies like Walmart, JCPenney, Sears use retail methods for their financial statements. So you could use this approach in external reporting. Why the retail method is more precise is that the cost to retail ratio is current. It's based on your current information. It is not 
based on historical gross profit or historical cost of goods sold percentages. So let's take um, an example. Let's go to, this will be our last illustration. So we have a company that has sales for the period of 40,000. So we know they have sales for 40,000. Now here's an example of the dual records that you have to keep. You have to keep a set of records at cost, and you have to keep a set of records at retail. So they have beginning inventory at their historical cost numbers. That could be LIFO, FIFO, average cost. They purchased 80, and their goods available for sale at cost is 100. At selling prices, the beginning inventory is 34. At selling prices, their inventory or purchased is 136. So their goods available for sale is 170. Now, if you work in retail, when you count the inventory, you're going to be using retail prices. So the cost, let me just finish this last thing. So still got three minutes. Cost to retail ratio is 59%. So that means just like having a cost of goods sold percentage of 60, this is a cost to retail ratio of 59. Now, how do you estimate your ending inventory? This is the last thing we'll do, but just hold it down so I can just get this point. If you take a look at your inventory calculation, it's beginning inventory at 20 at cost, 80 purchase, so your goods available are 100. When you get to the retail column, and this is the most important part of this, so I'll make sure you see this because I know there's some homework problems on this as well. When you take a look at the retail column, hold down please, yo. You got 170 as your goods available for sale at retail. When you subtract out sales at retail, it's basically saying that what is sales at retail? Sales at retail are really cost of goods sold at selling prices. So let me say that again. When you subtract out sales from your goods available at selling prices, you have to think about your sales as cost of goods sold at selling prices. So now I have an ending inventory at retail. If I multiply that by the cost to retail ratio, I estimate ending inventory at cost. So it's the same idea, you get a cost percentage against a retail price. All right, so now you're going to see this. The quiz will be up today at 4. You'll see this on the quiz. You'll see this on the homework. Next week, we start Chapter 8. We are skipping 7, Chapter 8. Okay, have a good weekend.